I've spent uh, three weekends doing an expose on how demons operate to torment us. Uh, last week I gave you the process for evicting them, but I, I, you know, I just blew through this issue of forgiveness, which so goes deeper than just a surface mention, you know, or in a list of things to check off. So there are just too many of us who deal with this. This is just way too serious. Uh, so we're just going to, you know, hit pause here for a minute and just reflect on this. For Jesus to say in Matthew 6, 15, but if you refuse to forgive others, read this with me, your father will not forgive your sins. That is huge. I mean, this is a massive way we can block the flow of God's grace into our lives. We can open the door to demonic activity. If you missed uh, the last uh, last week or either of the other two, actually all three of these, they're all now on our website for you to watch or to listen to. Uh, that, that really will bring you up to speed. It'll get you understanding where we're at in this series because I'd, I'd be taking a lot for granted if you haven't been with us and, uh, and it's important stuff. So you can watch that now. And I just want to start by saying that for us to hold on to bitterness is an affront to God. He released us from an immeasurable sin debt when we weren't even looking for it. So it offends him to no end when we refuse to forgive others. It's a big, big deal. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 33, Jesus spells the whole thing out by telling this story of a king who forgave a servant an insurmountable debt. But then that servant goes out and he mistreats someone who owed him an insignificant debt and here's how the king responded to that. He said to his servant, shouldn't you, have ha ha shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So Jesus tells the story, then he interprets it. That's what my father is gonna do to you. He's gonna turn you over to the torture. Well, that is a direct reference to demon torture because that's exactly what they do. They, they torment us with addictions. They shame us with guilt. They paralyze us with anxiety. They create chronic illness. They feed on our suffering. I mean, who in their right mind would put out a welcome mat for that? I don't, I don't want a horde of demonic rats making my life miserable. I'm doing a good job of doing that without help, you know? So... So, so that's what bitterness does to it. It invites demons in. So I want to magnify Jesus' words for us because uh, uh, I am convinced if we'll see unforgiveness for what it truly is, we will have nothing to do with this stuff. I mean, we will ditch it. A teacher wanted to get this across to her high school students, and she's real creative. She came up with this experiment to, to illustrate what this looks like. Uh, they walked into class one morning, and they saw that her desk was covered with potatoes. <clears throat> and these potatoes had been prepped. I mean, they were si they'd been sitting in her garage for weeks, so they're ready. They are ready for this day. She got her students all settled in, and then she said, I want you to come up, and, and, and uh, first I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the question. I want you to think about anybody in your life who's done you wrong. You know, people you just can't forgive for what they did to you. And then I want you to come up here and I want you to pick out a potato for each one of those people. And she uh, then sent them back to their desk with a plastic bag and a marker. And on each potato, they were to write the name of the person that came to mind. And on the outside of the bag, they were to write the word unforgiveness. Now, every kid took at least one potato, you know, which is interesting, isn't it? I mean, they're in high school and they're already amassing numbers. Some had four or five, some even more. And so they, you know, had pretty heavy bags. She said, all right, here's your assignment. I want you to take your bag of potatoes with you everywhere you go for the next week. You'll carry them from class to class during the day. You'll take them with you in your car. You'll keep them at your feet when you eat, when you study, when you watch TV, when you go online, when you're at your friend's house. I want you to keep them at your bedside when you sleep. Never let them out of your sight. That's your assignment. Of course, it was a huge inconvenience, major hassle. But the payoff came when the spuds started to go bad. Not much smells worse than a rotten potato. And these weren't, 
<laughs> if you remember, she prepped these things. They were right at the point of turning when the kids got them. So this is not something anybody wanted to be carrying around with them, much less, you know, taking them over to friends' houses. So when the stench began to rise, the kids said, I'm done with this. I forgive my potatoes. <laughs> and you know what? It was a lesson they never forget. Grudges stink up your life. It's no wonder they attract rats. It's no wonder they attract the demonic. So it just makes sense for us to forgive for our own good, doesn't it? I mean, I mean, duh, it seems so like common sense, and yet it's, it's, it slips away from us. So to help us remember that, we're gonna have potatoes at all the exits this morning. <laughs> Not really, but that would be an excellent way to cement this in our thinking. All right, look at what the Bible says in Romans 12, 17. He says, do not, this is Paul speaking, he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, if there's anything you can do about this, live at peace with everyone. Because some of you I know are thinking, okay, Ryan, let's say I do this. You know, I seriously doubt they're ever gonna make it right with me. How fair is that? Well, let me ask you this. Was Jesus dying on a cross for your sins so you wouldn't have to spend eternity in hell? Was that fair? That wasn't fair. So I definitely say God has moral authority to demand this of us. I mean, he went way, way, way beyond anything we'll ever do. As far as it depends on you, Paul says, you live at peace with them. And the next verse, verse 19, says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. He's talking about the guy whose name is on your potato. You know, do something good for him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, now here's just so we, you know, ruminate on this and get it. Well, here's what this looks like. When, you, when we get hurt in some way, maybe a friend betrays a confidence or a coworker lies about us or boy, boss takes advantage of us, we want to say something nice about them the next chance we get. Maybe buy their lunch, bring them coffee, clear the ice or snow off their car. You get, the, the idea is we want to move against bitterness. We don't want that stuff ever building up in our heart. We want to move against it. Then I love verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that is a brand new idea for 2020 Americans, right? That only happens in hearts that have been trained, trained by practice to let go of hurts and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to love the undeserving. So, that's some of the negative. Let's look at some of the positive benefits of forgiveness. These are some ways that God rewards us. I love Rick Warren's statement. He says, you can be bitter or you can be better. <laughs> Those are your only options. And God has an amazing exchange rate for hurts, the hurts I surrender to him, I should say. Number one, I get God's peace for my pain. A few years ago, Duke University did a study on peace of mind and among several other factors that contribute to a, our emotional and mental well-being, the biggest was the absence of suspicion or resentment. They found that holding on to resentment was a major factor in a person's unhappiness. That's why I say when we decide to forgive, we're in essence letting go of the pain by taking in God's peace. We're freeing our mind from the hassle of having to carry those rotten potatoes because it takes energy to hold on to that stuff. Every time we refuse to forgive, we lock in the pain and shut out the peace. And you have to ask yourself, is it really worth this? Is it, uh, yeah, yeah, what they did was awful, but is it really worth torturing myself? This week, I read the story of a journalist in Lebanon during their civil war back in the 80s. He was walking through the bombed out streets in, of Beirut, Beirut one day, and he heard beautiful music coming from the doorway, and uh, he got closer and saw a boy playing this. It's a flute that, that uh, he, was actually a rifle. The boy had found it in a field, bored holes in the barrel, and transformed it into a musical instrument. 
I love that. Because that's exactly what we do when we take that thing that someone used to wound us and we forgive them. We turn it into an instrument of God's peace in our life. Not just for ourselves, but for others. <clears throat> in the, it's the lesson of Joseph in the Old Testament, the coat of many colors kid, whose brothers got so jealous because the dad was doting on him that they were planning his murder and instead sold him to some slave traders. 20 years later, he's face to face with them again. You know, we read this in our Bible reading, only they don't recognize it. Joseph's now this powerful Egyptian ruler with the ability to inflict deadly vengeance. But Joseph had learned something in all those long, lonely years of battling through the pain of rejection because they weren't the only ones. I mean, he'd learned that even though he couldn't do anything about his past, he didn't have to let those hurts dictate his future. And you could just go through the litany. I mean, it just was one bad deal after another that he had to forgive. He submitted himself to God, even as bad as, as, as bad as things got. I mean, he just kept piling on. He found that life worked so much better if he just let it all go. I mean, he ended up in a dungeon. And even there, you know, the favor of God just rested on the kid, and he ended up running the jail. Over and over in Scripture, we see as he surrendered his hurts to God, amazing favor and blessing would come. If there was ever a guy who learned the truth of this life lesson, it's Joseph. Now, years later, Genesis 50, verse 20, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. He's saying, you guys used it as a rifle to sell me into slavery. God turned it into a flute. And as you're listening to this, I mean, as this is starting to sink in, if you will release the pain of your bitterness and resentment, you too can discover what others intended for your harm, God can superintend for your good. He can take what that old discarded rifle that was used against you, maybe you were you know, made fun of as a kid, that very event that caused you so much pain, he can use it to pay, play beautiful music through your life. You just gotta release it to him. You gotta give him the potato. That's the first great reward for forgiveness. We can exchange our pain for his peace. Here's the second, I get God's health for my hurt. I read a part of an article by Dr. Friedrich Luskin of Stanford University addressing the effect of unforgiveness on our health. He said, holding grudges doesn't just mess with your mood. It can lead to headaches, neck pain, stomach problems. He said, when someone hurts you and you obsess about it, excuse me, your body suffers. He adds, can't bring yourself to turn the other cheek? Think of it this way. Forgiveness is for your own well-being to reduce your suffering. Studies have found that unforgiveness releases the stress hormone cortisol into our bodies. If you read about this, it's not a good thing. I mean, it's a chemical that stops your body from burning fat and stores it on you. I mean, you don't want that. And it affects all kinds of other organs of your body. Unforgiveness leads to ruminating over the hurt, replaying it on a continuous loop in our brain, which reinforces our negative emotions and burns the pain deeper into our neural pathways. When we remain stressed for long periods of time by refusing to give, cortisol causes our brain to atrophy, resulting in diminished memory. Man, we don't need that happening. We're, you know, <laughs> those of us who are getting older, you know, we've we got enough you know, memory problems, all right? We don't need more of that. But since we're looking at the positive here, here's a story from an excellent book. I'm telling you, this, ooh, this is a good one. It's on forgiveness. The guy's name is Bruce Wilkerson. I read it uh, actually 2017, the end of that year. And uh, man, this has helped me so much to understand the gravity of what we're talking about because I never took this as seriously as I did after I read this book because it just was like, oh man, talk about a wake up call. It's called, the new title is The Secret of Lasting Forgiveness. He and his wife prayed with a woman who deeply resented a man that had hurt her whole family. I mean, she had all kinds of rights to be bitter. But she you know, finally decided to forgive him. And, and as they're talking to her, God healed her of a painful allergy right in front of them. They literally watched her eat food she was allergic to, highly allergic to, with no ill effect. Just boom. Fellow pastor told a story about a woman who suffered from severe arthritis. Her fingers were so gnarled she couldn't open her hands. 
She, uh, and I'm sure you've probably seen, you know, seen that or seen pictures of it. Uh, she asked him to pray for her healing. When nothing happened, he asked if maybe there was something that wasn't right in her heart. And he said, oh, man, she began to spew like a volcano. Her husband died five years earlier, and she hated that man with a passion. I mean, he had abused her. He had been a terrible husband. The pastor assured her, you know, that he understood how hard it must have been to endure all that abuse, but, but her hatred was like poisoning her body, and she, she had to forgive him. She said, well, I've tried. I just can't do it. I don't feel anything. He said, well, forgiveness has nothing to do with feelings. I mean, and we all need to hear that one, because forgiveness is not a feeling. It's an act of obedience to God's word. It's an act of our will. We simply... We're simply doing what he tells us to do. And the minute we engage, God energizes us with the power to do it. He told her about God's absolute law. He said, if you don't forgive, he won't forgive you. In essence, you keep this locked up in your heart, you'll seal in the bad stuff and shut out the good. And then he confronted her with the truth about how much grace and forgiveness she had received as a free gift in Christ. And he asked her, how she could possibly feel justified withholding forgiveness from uh, you know, somebody else. And he offered to help her pray, and as she said the words, I forgive my husband, she began to just weep out years of bitterness. And in that moment, he said, literally in that moment, she, she cried out, she said, look at my fingers. She could move her hands, the arthritis was completely gone. Now I'm not saying In every case of arthritis or allergy, it's the result of unforgiveness. You know, you can throw away your Claritin. You know, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that releasing your hurts will release all that poison in your system. And if bitterness has caused the sickness, then you're gonna get better. This is why the Bible says in James 5, 16, if you ever wondered what this verse was about, This is what it's about. He says, confess your sins to each other. Let's read it. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. If we're seeking God for healing and wholeness, part of the deal is that we confess and release bitterness we may be holding on to. I mean, if you think about it, what a deal. I mean, we get to trade in our hurts for God's help. Then number three, I get God's love for my loss. One of, one of the most powerful stories, I know you guys, have, many of you have heard this, but it, it's one of the most powerful stories of forgiveness that I've heard. It's Corey, from Corey Ten Boom. Uh, it was two years after World War II it ended, and she had been traveling around Germany speaking about God's forgiveness, because man, the country needed it, if you can you know, imagine. At the end of one service, she looked up and saw a familiar face approaching. Uh, the man had been a guard at, a not, at the Nazi camp, concentration camp in Ravensbrück. Corey and her sister Betsy had been imprisoned there for hiding Jews in their home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. Betsy had died in that camp, and this very guard had the most to do with her death. So think about this. He's coming at her. Here it is, just two years later, and Corey's standing face to face with this man. He reached out his hand and said, how good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. She knew the guard didn't remember her, but boy, did she remember him. The dresses, the shoes piled on the floor, the shame of walking naked past the guard, the leather crop that hung from his belt, the skull and crossbones on his cap. Then the guard said that he had become a Christian, and he knew that God had forgiven him. With his hand reaching to her, he said, Fraulein, will you forgive me? Corey stood there frozen for what seemed like hours unable to shake his hand. She knew she needed to forgive him. She'd seen firsthand how bitterness affected the Holocaust victims who who could not forgive their enemies, but Corey knew that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. Jesus, help me, she prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, she said, I thrust my hand to the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. She said, for a long moment, they grasped each other's hands. 
the former guard and the former prisoner. She said, I had never known God's love so intensely as I did that night. While she was still at Ravensbrook, she, she wrote the, the words, no matter how deep our darkness, God's love is deeper still. Like Corey, you may have to say, Lord, I'm not feeling this, but I'm willing. Help me as I forgive this person, help me. It's when you act out in simple obedience that you start to experience his love, flooding into that place of loss and regret. That's what Peter, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, love covers over a multitude of sins. You let out the loss and God's love will replace it. Then another great reward of forgiveness is number four, I get God's life for my strife. When you hang on to bitterness, you're giving the, the enemy a foothold. It's, that, it's what we talked about last week. We, we looked at footholds. It's like an access point that enables you to take more ground. It can be just you know a little thing, like a few inches sticking out of a wall. You've seen a climbing wall before. But you know it, it, it can be just, just real tiny, but you can rest your foot just enough to push off to climb higher. And that's what demons do when we give them a little peg of bitterness to stand on. Now, I heard somebody tell a story that just so perfectly illustrates this. Uh, a man lived in a poor village, and he wanted to sell his house for $2,000. So, you know, it's a poor village. Another guy wanted to buy it, but he didn't have the money. So eventually, the owner agreed to sell it to him for half the original price with one stipulation. He would retain access to one nail above the front door. It went in the contract. He would own the nail and the buyer would own the house. And the guy thought, well, I, you know, I definitely can live with that. Several years later, the original owner decided he wanted the house back, but the new owner said, no, I won't sell it to you. So the man who owned the nail found the carcass of a dead animal and hung it on the, over the door. And soon the house just reeked with death. And the man got his house back, all because of one little nail. Now that is a picture of how the enemy works on us. When you surrender your heart to Jesus, your heart becomes his home. I mean, Satan no longer has any claim on that house. So he will try to talk you in to giving him an innocent little nail somewhere. And once you give it to him, you can bet he's gonna hang some rotten garbage on it and mess up your heart, make your life miserable, and because demons are attracted to rotten garbage, you're gonna end up with an infestation. Nothing will expose you to demonic torment faster than hanging on to bitterness. Isn't that a good picture? That'll, <laughs> that'll you know, just imagine stinking, rotten, decaying flesh. You know, you don't wanna have that hanging in your life anywhere. Satan comes along and says, what they did to you was so awful. I mean, you, you have every right to be bitter. What he's really saying is, give me a nail. I got, I got some rotten stuff to hang on that thing. That's why Ephesians 4.26 says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it quickly, and do not give the enemy what? A foothold. Don't go giving him a nail. Instead, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, all the junk that goes along with my right to be angry. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Here it is. Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. When you choose to forgive and let it go, you essentially take away the devil's nail to hang his garbage in your life. Now, I know that seems like such a little thing, but he will use it to take over your life if you, if you give it into this stuff and you allow him to do that. So let go of strife, take in God's life, and finally, when we choose to let it go, here's the reward number five. We open up the tomb and give God room to bless us. When we take that place of death, hurt, loss, pain, and decide to obey God, saying, Lord, everything in me wants to hang on to this and nurse it and curse it and rehearse it, I want to punish that person? Ooh, I want to. I can think up some awesome ways for you to just let them have it. Because it feels so good to, hurt, to hate them for what they did to me. But it's killing me. So I'm opening up this tomb of death. I'm letting out all the stench, and I'm inviting you in. 
When we do that, we give God room to work in our lives in all kinds of ways. Like Joseph, mercy and kindness get built into our character and we become magnets for God's blessing. Lamentations 3.22 says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We used to sing this. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. We were singing some of this earlier. Great is your faithfulness, God. God is always wanting to show us mercy. I mean, we were singing that refrain over and over uh, this morning. He's always wanting to bless our, our lives. Bitterness short circuits his plan. James Robinson said something profound in that book I mentioned that, he, that I just finished, uh, Living Amazed. He said, God is never disappointed in us. He never goes, oh, just what I expected of you, you know. You're such a loser. He's never, ever, ever disappointed in us, but he does get disappointed for us. Think about that. He does go, oh, I so want to see you get this right because I want you to be blessed. This is, gonna, this is gonna leave a mark. This is gonna do you harm. Does that make sense? He's not disappointed in us. He gets disappointed for us because he wants us to succeed. That's huge. God is, out, is not out to penalize us even when we're holding on to bitterness. He just wants us to repent and get it right so we become blessable, which I'm surprised is not a word. I just made that a word. <laughs> blessable should be a word. Siri should not correct that. <laughs> I get so tired. You know, unforgivable or unforgiveness I can't get my lexicon to recognize that one either. We need to get this secular translator stuff worked out, all right? Get them with the Bible. You know, if you will get this right, you might even get a miracle of reconciliation out of the deal. Because, you know, obviously there's another person's will involved in the thing, but I can tell you this, when you get your side of the street cleaned up, it's a, way more of a possibility because I've seen this happen. I have watched God do amazing things. Maybe the very nail the enemy is using to keep your spouse mired in spiritual indifference and unbelief and hardness of heart is your own resentment, is your own lack of forgiveness. I read a, a, another story about that very thing, a woman refused to forgive her husband because she, man, this woman had grounds. I mean, his infidelity had wrecked their marriage, devastated their family. It's another case where she had gone into her pastor seeking healing for a physical condition, and when he went through some of the scriptures about you know, forgiveness and these kind of things, bitter, you know, the bitterness just all came out. She, he, he told her she had to forgive her husband for her own sake. And finally, just after a colossal battle, she was willing to let it go. This guy was living with another woman at the time. I mean, he had walked out on, it was, it was awful. A week later, after the Sunday service, this same woman came to the pastor's office with a man. She said, this is him. This is my husband. And the first words out of his mouth are, do you think God can forgive me? I am a great sinner. A week ago, I started feeling very guilty. Now, what else was happening a week ago? <laughs> she was forgiving him. I started feeling incredibly guilty. I couldn't stand the pain I felt inside. I started thinking about my wife and the children I'd abandoned and not being able to relieve myself from the guilt I felt. I, I thought of committing suicide, but I decided to come to church instead, hoping to get forgiven. I noticed my wife on the other side of the auditorium. That's when I decided to ask her and God for forgiveness. Can God forgive me, he said. Right there in that pastor's office, this man came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He reunited with his wife and children, and she later received a tremendous healing from a physical condition that had racked her body with pain for all that bitterness. Now again, I can't promise every story will have that same happy ending, but I can say your life will be so much better if you'll open up the tomb and give God room to work. You'll get free of all the torment that bitterness is doing to your soul. Remember Jesus said the Father will literally stand back and turn you over to, to, to their torment if you refuse to let it go. When you forgive, demons lose access to your life. And many times in that act of forgiveness, God says, okay, 
Now that you got it right, I'm going to work on the other person. Ephesians 3.20 says, you set the stage for God to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But we got to open up the tomb to give him room. I read the story uh, last week, or maybe it was the week before, of a woman who, between the ages of five and 16, was abused sexually and physically by seven different men. Her dad committed suicide, and that's when the whole firestorm began. Uh, she was five at the time, which led to a, just a bunch of other guys coming and going through their house. Her mom became a drug addict. These guys were selling drugs, abusing all the kids. They were living in a two-bedroom trailer, sometimes with no water or electricity. Her brother was murdered in 2004. Her life was a mess. I mean, the abuse was, was so horrible. The pastor was, talk, was reading a letter from her and said, I can't even go into it. It's, it's just too awful. If anybody had the right to be filled with hatred and bitterness, it was this woman. But her pastor was teaching a series on forgiveness and as he's going through this stuff, she starts working through her pain. She ended up going to her dad's grave. And she said, you know, I had mouthed the words I forgive you before, but I never meant them, at least not until now. I had to tell my dad why I was so upset with him for leaving. The pastor said, even though she didn't know how to do it, she was following the exact protocol to get free. And I'm gonna go over that with you next weekend. Because I, I really think, I think, you know, it's not enough to just talk about this. I, I don't want to do the thing when you tell your teenagers, now ask him to forgive you. Will you forgive me? Yeah, I forgive you. <laughs> sure you did. Sure, both of you meant that. Yeah, right? So I want to, I wanna, we want to go a little deeper, all right? We're going to get at this thing. Uh, so she went wound by wound at the graveyard, telling her dad why she was so upset with what he'd done. She said, not only did you miss out on my life, you missed out on my boys, you missed out on my great husband, and now my older son has a baby and you're missing out on that. I don't know why you felt taking your life was better than staying. But I was finally, for the first time in my life, able to forgive him and bless him and actually mean it. I've also forgiven my mom and my aunt and I've released all the men who hurt me, even though I have no clue who some of them are. I've forgiven the person who murdered my brother. And a week later in a church service, she was finally able to forgive the guy who had been her main tormentor for many years. And then on Monday, she sent the pastor a letter to help fill in the blank. She wrote, on Sunday morning, I was getting ready for church and the Lord brought me to tears saying, today's the day. She said, I knew what he meant. I just wasn't sure I wanted it. I knew he was speaking to me about my biggest tormentor. She said, when you went through the part about letting people out of the prison cell, we'll get into that, all right? We'll talk about that. She said, I sat with my eyes closed and I finally unlocked every person, including the tormentor from the cell in my heart. I unchained them and I hugged each person, letting them walk free. There was no one left to forgive. I saw myself hugging the Lord. And then he showed me a field with a kite flying high. She said, what's funny about the kite reference is a few weeks ago, I went up to, to get encouraged in the prayer time, and she said one of the people there told me, God showed her that I was a kite. I fly high, I hover, I learn, and then the Lord lets out more string, and I go to the next level and do the same thing. So once I let them go, She's talking about all the people that she'd been bitter toward. I saw the kite flying high. I knew I was free and would be moving on to the next level with God. Thanks again, Pastor, as I no longer feel that I am drowning. Is that not awesome? I mean, is that a, not an awesome story of God's mercy? And I'll tell you why I'm reading that because I know some of you here have experienced that kind of intense pain. You have, you have lived with stuff that no human should have gone through. And I wanna read you, I read you that to give you hope. I want you to leave here today knowing that Jesus has not abandoned you. 
He knows the pain you've suffered. He wants to heal those wounds that are messing with you and inviting torment. He wants to get the nail out of your life. It's time to ditch your rotten potatoes. It's time to forgive those people. Here's your assignment this week. I'm, I'm just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take this step by step. Ask God to show you all the people who hurt you. I, this would be a good week to start a journal. Just all the people who have hurt you. Any area where you feel like you might be carrying resentment. And I'll tell you, go, go a step further. Ask God to show you all the jagged rocks that they used to wound you. All, put the person's name and then all the various things, because we're gonna go over this step by step and we're gonna release those things. We're gonna get freedom flowing in our hearts. I believe God wants us to be free. For many of you, that's gonna get those demonic squatters totally off your property. It's gonna, it's gonna evict them. Tell me, God paid too high a price for your freedom to watch you suffer. He wants you, the Bible says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. God wants you free indeed, not just a little bit free. He wants you living without that pain. Now I know, you know, for some of you, this is the first time you've heard teaching like this, and I always like to go over the gospel. I mean, Christianity is not a religion. It's not about God making bad people good. It's about God making dead people alive. That's the point. It's not about rule keeping. It's not about trying to fix yourself. It's about a relationship. Here's a simple gospel. I never get tired of this. And some of you are thinking, oh, here he goes again. I'm telling you why I'm doing this. I want you to be able to do it. I want you to be able to say these words because these are the words. The power of God is in the gospel. It is the power of God to save souls. That's what Paul said, all right? God created us in his own image to be his family. That's, that, that's right there is where the Bible starts and that's unique from something that has never happened. He breathed his own breath of life into us. We're his image bearers. We're uniquely different from all his creation. He made the angels to be his servants. We were made to be his sons and daughters. But for a love relationship to work, it has to be reciprocal. So he gave us the freedom to choose and that was the glitch. Man sinned, and that sin spread to the whole human race. We all have the disease, and the Bible says if reincarnation was true and we had a thousand lifetimes, we'd never get it right. We can't do it, we can't pull it off because the sin is in our DNA. And so God fixed the problem. The Son of God became a human being. He became one of us, lived a perfect life, so that he could become the perfect sacrifice. This is where so many people miss, miss the whole deal. They think, well, you know, Jesus came down to teach us about God. No, he didn't. He was not a great, he was not just a great teacher. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's not just a great teacher. He became sin with our sin. The Bible says, he died the only sinless man so that God could judge our sin in his human body, the human body of his own son. That, that was so unthinkable. The Bible says the demonic world could not conceive of it. The scripture says they would never have crucified the Lord of glory had they known what was happening on the cross. God was, Paul says, God was nailing our sins to Jesus' cross. So when Jesus walks out of that tomb with a resurrected human body, <laughs> you know, everything's over and the demonic world knew it. I mean, they knew it's over. We're done, we're done for. A human now has come, from, come out of Hades with his body and he is now ruling. He has the keys of death and hell. He is now Lord, and he has power to forgive our sins, to resurrect our dead spirits, and make us righteous with his own righteousness so we can be at home with a holy God. You know, some of you, for, that's, for the first time, that just made sense. It's like, what? I'm gonna invite you to pray a real simple prayer of invitation for him to do that. Because when he comes into your life, it's a forever deal. You will never die. Jesus said, you'll be born again spiritually. You'll live with me forever. And you know what? You'll know it. 
fact, how many of you know that that, that has happened for you? That that has happened for you? This, see, we're not talking about joining a club or joining a church. I mean, that's what happens, but we're talking about being born again, having the life of God come into your dead spirit. And if this is making sense, that's a miracle because Jesus said you can't get this by human understanding. This comes by Holy Spirit illumination. And the reason your heart's beating a little fast right now is because you're realizing the Holy Spirit is showing me this. He's inviting me into the family. That's what's happening. That's, that's what's about to happen here. <laughs> you're getting invited into the family of God. This is not about how you were raised. This is not about what catechism you went through. This is not how you were baptized as a baby. You know, this is about Jesus saving you from your sins and recreating your spirit. Amen. All right, let's bow our heads together. I'm gonna make this real simple. If you're not sure that's ever happened, if you're not sure that you have eternal life and that you're gonna spend eternity with Jesus in heaven and you wanna have that assurance, if you wanna know that you're going to live forever, <laughs> the invitation's been given. All you have to do is respond to it. Jesus said you need, to, you need to acknowledge your condition, your broken condition, and simply come to me as you are. How many of you across this room and those of you who are watching would just say, that, that's me, I want in, I want in. Just raise your hand right now and we're gonna pray to you. I'm gonna pray for you right now. I'm gonna make it real simple, all right? See your hands going up anywhere else? Anyone else? Anyone else? I mean, this is your moment. It's a holy moment before God. Anywhere else? All right, all right. I see, you don't have to be ashamed of this, guys. I see hands still up. Anywhere else? I see hands. All right, let's stand together. Now, I don't... I try to keep this as simple in my mind because this is just, it, it's not like you're trying to get God to do something he doesn't wanna do. God's going, oh boy, oh boy, my son, my, my daughter's coming home, coming home. So you just come to God, you come to God like that, you come to God, I don't, offer, I don't bring anything but just me, Lord. I, I'm not gonna barter with you, I'm not gonna try to convince you I'm better than other people. I'm coming to you just as I am without one plea but that Jesus' blood was shed for me and that you're bidding me to come to thee. That's the old Billy Graham song. Yeah. Lord, I come. Amen. Lord, here I am. All right, let's pray together. I know, just, let's just say these words out loud together. God, I believe that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he is. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no one can come to the Father except through me. So Jesus, I come to you. I put my total trust in what you did for me on the cross. You took my place. You bore my sin. So I'm asking you to forgive me, cleanse me, and make you Lord of my life. I surrender my will to yours, and I receive your free gift of eternal life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can love you and follow you with my whole heart. Thank you for saving me. Amen, amen. Let's thank him for that. Let's thank him for that miracle.